We are in uh, Parashat Korach. Uh, I said it yes last week. I'll say it again this week. One of my most favorite parashot, and uh, not because of uh, the act, rather because of the message. If uh, you read the parasha, the Torah portion, for the act or the facts, that's one thing. But if you read the Torah in order to derive some lesson and some uh, tools how to act in this world, then you, then you hit the jackpot. So when the parasha has a very profound message, then that needs to be taken in the right measure. So there's no uh, much uh, to elaborate and to add. You all know the story of Korach, that the Korach, the, it, it boiled down to that he was jealous of Moshe. That's what it boiled down to. No need to give too much background about uh, Korach. Korach was Moshe's cousin. He, he didn't like the fact that Moshe is the leader. You know, uh, sometimes when people grow together, it can be in the family and it can be also friends and classmates. And uh, sometimes you, I mean, we're all, Baruch Hashem, uh, lived a long life so far. Hashem should bless us all to continue having a long life. But sometimes you look back and, oh, yeah, he was with high school in me. And you, uh, you know, <laughs> a few years ago I had a, a, not a reunion, but my class I had like a kind of a reunion. They gathered all the people from my, my class. I, was, I lived in the States at the time. I, didn't, I couldn't come. But they made a, a, a Facebook group, a WhatsApp group, and everybody was posting pictures. And it was funny to look at all the pictures. Of course, when I po posted pictures, everybody's like, who are you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm the one who used to beat you up. So, uh, <laughs> so nobody recognized with this look. So I had to post old pictures, and, uh, but anyways, why am I saying that? Because it would be, it was very funny to see who turned out like what. You know, the nerd of the class, we always thought he would uh, be, I don't know what, the next uh, uh, person who would invent something or whatever, and the, this guy, or that. it was funny to see who ended up what. And why am I saying that? Because sometimes you grow up with somebody and suddenly they uh, become famous, they become uh, successful, very rich, or you don't see them for 20 years. What are you doing right now? Oh, I'm uh, the CEO of this company. I'm... So that was the story with Korach. They grew up, Moshe and Korach grew together, they're cousins. And suddenly Moshe becomes the leader. So, uh, it all started from jealousy, and needless to say, you know the story that he ended up uh, challenging Moshe, slandering Moshe, gathering everybody against Moshe, and we'll go through some other details uh, throughout the class. But uh, <clears throat> when we're looking at a situation like this, one can understand that jealousy is one of the worst uh, midot, or one can say the worst diseases amongst us. And, uh, and I'm saying a disease because, uh, because uh, you know, disease has the potential and the opportunity and the, and the way to be healed. And unfortunately, we all have jealousy. Whether you are aware of it or not, even though you're saying, oh, I'm the most not jealous person in the world, okay. But the master of the universe had made sure that we all have one person at least to be jealous of. Everybody has jealousy. And I will elaborate on that throughout the class and we'll explain it more depth because many of you I'm sure are like, I'm not jealous of anybody, I'm actually happy for everybody. But if you look between the lines or if you really search deep down inside, you'll find that there's at least one person that you're jealous of. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going out to the world slandering the person and, uh, and uh, wishing for that person to be hurt. Or, but the fact is that the master of the universe created and he made sure that each and every one of us is somebody to be jealous of. And I will explain it more in depth so you will uh, understand what I mean. Now, why am I saying that, that Hashem made sure that everybody has somebody to be jealous of, because even the, one of the most selected personnel in the history, which is Moshe Rabbeinu, was also jealous. And he testifies on himself that he was jealous. It's not that he was hiding it. Now, 
You know, when you look at a certain individual like Moshe Rabbeinu, who the Torah testified on him two, two parashot ago in Baalotecha, Raish Haya Anav Mekol, the most humble person in the world. The Moshe Rabbeinu speaks to, Mo, to God face to face. Lokam ke navi ke Moshe, there'll never be a prophet like Moshe. So I take that he's one of the most uh, highest level individuals. And he testifies on himself, I, I was also jealous. So if Moshe Rabbeinu has jealousy, then each and every one of us has it. Maybe it's not so obvious. Or maybe I have to be more particular. It doesn't mean that I'm jealous of a certain person my, all my entire life. It can be sometimes one day that I have jealousy. Or one event. Or one encounter. But Moshe Rabbeinu says on himself, you know, I also had jealousy. And since Moshe Rabbeinu is humble enough to come and say, as great as I am, I also mess up, then must be that we also have it, even if in a refined way, and we also have to recognize it, and also to come and say, you know, who am I kidding? I also have some jealousy here and there. Now, where exactly Moshe Rabbeinu has jealousy? In Parashat Vayelech, Moshe Rabbeinu is about to die. And he starts uh, giving over jobs and instructions. And then he comes uh, to his successor, to Yeshua. And he says, you are going to be the next leader. I have to prepare you. Okay. So Moshe Rabbeinu takes Yeshua after being a very dedicated servant for 40 years. And he takes him into the, 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 the tent, into the Mishkan. And Yeshua goes in by himself. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't enter. And Yoshua comes out, okay. So Moshe Rabbeinu tells him, no? Yoshua says, what, what do you mean, no? No, what did Hashem tell you? What do you mean, what did Hashem tell me? He's like, did he give you any new mitzvot? Did he, some, some additions to the Torah? What, 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 how was your meeting with the master of the universe? What did he tell you? So Yoshua answers him, for the last 40 years when you came out of the tent, did I ask you what did Hashem told you? What is that? You, it's not your business. And of course, Yoshua didn't say that in such a disrespectful way to Moshe Rabbeinu, but saying in other words, I, didn't, I never asked you what was your uh, impression or what did the master of the universe told you when you were in the tent. Why are you asking me? Moshe Rabbeinu says, this can be found in the Midrash, Midrash Rabba, chapter 9, verse 9, Moshe Rabbeinu says, I rather die a hundred times than to experience jealousy for one second. Moshe Rabbeinu was jealous. He suddenly figures out, there's a new king, there's a new leader. I'm now number two. Hashem doesn't speak to me anymore. He's speaking to Yoshua. Moshe Rabbeinu held a little bit of jealousy, to a point that Moshe Rabbeinu, of course, stopped himself right away. And he says, Adif mea mitot I rather die a hundred times, but not to experience jealousy for one second. And Moshe Rabbeinu says clearly. And again, like I told you, if you want, you can go to the Midrash, Midrash Rabbah, uh, on the book of Devarim, chapter 9, verse 9. You'll read the whole story there. Very, very interesting. So if this is the case, today we want to uh, present uh, a question. And of course a solution. If we're presenting questions, we have to come with solutions. <clears throat> if Moshe Rabbeinu has a glimpse of jealousy, must be that we also had it or have it or will have it at some point in our life. And again, I'm now addressing people who the jealousy is very hidden and they're not really jealous individuals. If you are a jealous individual, that's a whole different problem. Needless to say, this class will give you enough tools and guidance what to do. Some people, unfortunately, they're jealous of everything that's around them. That person has more money, that person is successful, this person is uh, wealthy, this person achieved what they wanted to achieve. Now, again, some people it goes out of control and they harm the person they're jealous of, and some people it's just stayed inside, but they still have this jealousy. So this is the case. What can you tell a person... Or what should a person tell to himself when he has a little bit of jealousy? And by the way, this jealousy can happen between you and your spouse, between you and your uh, brother or sister, your parents, kids, somebody very, very close. 
And it can be a moment of jealousy or something that is bothering you for the last 20 years. Now, the first question that we want to focus on is what do you tell yourself or what can you tell a person in the moment when they have a little bit of jealousy? But a more deeper question that we're going to focus on is if I have jealousy towards something, that's bad to start with, but if this is the case, and I was able to recognize that I have this jealousy, then how do I learn to love my life and appreciate what Hashem gave me? Because if I'm jealous of you, I'm not happy with my life. Why does he have more? Why is he more successful? So it means, A, I'm jealous of you. B, I'm not happy with what I have. Because if I would be happy with what I have, then why would I be jealous? Then how do you cause yourself to appreciate what Hashem gave you and that you love your life? <clears throat> and of course, with that, I need to come to a place where I can tell to myself, I'm in the best place that could be. Now the reality is that we all have challenges, we all have difficulties. Uh, unfortunately, most people are dealing with the very hard uh, situations. Some people more or less, some people more. Usually it seems like what I'm dealing with is the worst and you have it much better than me. But the reality is because Mashiach is coming very, very soon and we all have to deal with a lot of challenges. And these challenges can cause an individual to say, I'm not happy with my life. This is not working out. That is not working out. Why does this have to be like this and like that? So how do I get to a point that I can understand that I'm in the best place possible? Right now where I am, with all the difficulties that I have, with all the challenges and the failures and everything that I wanted and didn't work out, that's the best thing that can happen to me. And I know it sounds a little bit unclear, but let's go through the class. Bezal Hashem uh, will be very educated today. So, going back to the situation with Moshe Rabbeinu, who Moshe Rabbeinu is really one of the uh, most powerful role models that we have. That's why we call him Rabbeinu, by the way. Because Rabbeinu means our teacher. Technically, we should have called him Moshe Hanavi, because he's the best prophet, right? Who do we call him? We can Shmuel Hanavi, Eliyahu Hanavi. And Moshe should have been called Hanavi, because he's the top of all the prophets. And if not Moshe Hanavi, then Moshe HaMelech. He was the first king. So there could have been many titles to Moshe, but we call him Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher. Saying, in other words, that is the perfect role model. So going back to the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu had jealousy with Yoshua, and he says, I'd rather die a hundred times than to experience one moment of jealousy. And this happened right before he died, because he gave over the, the throne, the, the control to Yoshua, and that's it. After that he dies. Now, if Moshe Rabbeinu is addressing that, then we have to really go deep and see what's going on here. Now, in this week's parasha, we're experiencing the jealousy of Korach. But Korach is not the first person in the Torah that has jealousy. Now, press the rewind button. I'll do some sound effects. And we go to the first day of creation. Right? Master of the universe creates the world. Within six days, we have a beautiful, beautiful world. And then the first encounter of jealousy is documented in the Torah. The Nachash, the serpent, was jealous of Adam Arishon. It says very clearly, Adam Arishon was with Chava, they were together. The Nachash saw them together, and he was jealous. He says, okay, let me kill Adam and I'll marry Chava. Now when the Torah says Nachash, don't imagine some spaghetti going into uh, Gan Eden. Nachash looked like Adam Arishon, he looked like a human. He was smart like a human. He spoke. His attribute was like a snake. Sneaky and, and tricky. So the Nachash was jealous of Adam Arishon. He says, okay, let me see how I can manipulate here the, this woman. And I'll have her kill him. And then I'll marry her. First encounter of jealousy in the Torah. We didn't pass many verses. And then we find another act of jealousy. We have two kids of Adam and Chava, there's nobody in the world, nobody holds any property in the world, there's no people in the world, and two brothers are fighting over the control. Now I know in the Torah it says uh, in a clear way that both Cain and Hevel brought an offering to the master of the universe, 
and Cain uh, and Hashem turned to the offering of heaven, Cain was jealous and killed him, right? But there was other parts of the jealousy because Hevel was born with two twins and twin girls and Cain was born with one twin girl. So he's like, how come you're getting two women and I'm, I'm, I'm only one? So we see already, usually jealousy will be for money, control, power and women. So Cain kills Hevel. So we see another act of jealousy here. He wasn't happy. Now why would Cain kill Hevel? What's the big deal? You own half the world. You, you, you obviously, you know, you have nothing to be jealous of. So he has another woman. Or as the Torah says, he brought another, a better offering than you. That's why you kill him. Okay, we're going to analyze the whole thing very soon. But I just want to go through different acts of jealousy. <clears throat> Nevertheless, as the time goes by, then we now are uh, uh, again seeing an jealousy in the Torah. Of course, by Korach. Korach is the cousin of Moshe Rabbeinu, a first cousin, by the way. Because if you're going back four generations, you have uh, the tribe of Levi. Levi has four kids. We went through that two parashot ago. Gershon, Kehat, and Merari, and Yochemet. Then they all have kids. And uh, Cain is the son of Itzhar, <coughs> the son of Kihat. Okay? So Kihat has uh, three kids. Uh, four kids, Amram, Itzar, uh, Hebron, and Uziel, and Cain is the son of Itzar. Okay. And Moshe Rabbeinu is the first cousin. And as we uh, read, Moshe Rabbeinu becomes the leader. Now they all know each other for many, many years. They grew up together, playing in the same kindergarten, and suddenly Moshe becomes a leader. And not just a leader. <laughs> Unbelievable leader. Okay, that already is one stab to the heart. And a few months later, Aaron, the brother, who is also uh, 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 Korach's first cousin, becomes Kohen Gadol. Now Korach says, what about me? How come they're a king and a, and a Kohen? What, what, what am I? Human garbage? I also want a, a job here. Now, what's interesting here is that Korach was very, very wealthy. First of all, he was a Talmid Chacham. Second of all, he was a you know, high society, you know what it is, to be in the tribe of Levi. More than that, he was one of the most, if not the most richest person in the generation then. He was very wealthy. Now you would think, what does a wealthy person have to be jealous of? You know that up until today, they say in Hebrew, if they want to uh, describe somebody who's rich, they say, Ashir ka Korach, he's rich like Korach. Now, how did Korach become rich? They were all slaves in Mitzrayim, even though the Shevet Levi weren't slaves. But nevertheless, the story says that when Yosef gathered all the food in the seven good years, later on, when he sold all the food, Yosef collected all the money in the world because nobody had food. So for seven years, Yosef gathered all the food. Then seven years later, he sold everything. They, they were gazillionaires. They owned everything. The story says that Korach found one of the safes of Yosef. And that, then it wasn't like a, a digital bank accounts with the... It was actual money, whether it was gold or silver or jewelry. So he found one of the safes and he became very, very wealthy. Okay, now comes a very interesting question that the commentaries ask. You know, this whole encounter happened a year and a half after going out of Mitzrayim. Suddenly Korach remembers. Took him a year and a half to suddenly come with the claim. What about me? You saw Moshe Rabbeinu was already the leader before you left Mitzrayim. And Aaron was appointed to be the Kohen way before that. Suddenly you flip out and you start making problems. Why? What, what took you so long? What triggered Korach at the time a year and a half after they go out of Mitzrayim to suddenly lose his calmness? Okay, so a beautiful commentary by the Ramban, Nachmanides, says the act of the spies that we read last week, that triggered him. Because up until then, Moshe Rabbeinu was a very powerful leader. After the act of the spies, it shook, so to say, 
the political power of Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? Because after the golden calf, that there was a decree to kill everybody, Moshe Rabbeinu, on behalf of the nation, plead, prayed and everything, and was able to get everything uh, straightened out. Now, they, were still got, they still got punished for 40 years. They were like, hey, Moshe, this time you can't pull your strings, you can't help us out here, now we're all going to be punished and die in the desert. So there was a little bit of uh, bitterness by the people towards Moshe Rabbeinu. Koach said, now, you strike the iron while it's hot. Now, he's a little bit, uh, his uh, uh, political power right now is a little bit shaky. I'm going to attack now. That's what the Ramban says. <clears throat> now, the second that Koach sees that there's a little bit of an issue, he starts a campaign right away. He starts a campaign against Moshe Rabbeinu by saying, who needs you? You know, he also came up with all sorts of slogans. Instead of Build Back Better and the Great Reset, he says, who needs you? Maybe they had a bumper sticker. Who needs you? Right? So he starts a campaign against Moshe Rabbeinu. What good are you for us if you weren't able to protect us and pray on our behalf? We don't need you. Then he starts another type of campaign by saying, you know, we're all holy. Why are you more holier than me? Yakorach was very, very tricky. He wasn't saying, I want to be the leader. He says, all of us can be leaders. So he got everybody hyped up against Moshe Rabbeinu. And by the way, all this is because of jealousy. Because he was saying, what about me? I, I also want a position. He's a king. He's a, a Kohen Gadol. I also want something. So it started with jealousy. And needless to say, we read in the parasha that ended up in death. Very interestingly... Uh, a commentary by the Eben Ezra. Eben Ezra was about a thousand years ago in Spain. Very powerful commentary. He says something interesting. He says usually a person will be jealous only about, jealous of somebody that is close to them. You're not jealous of somebody on the other side of the world. And usually it will be that you're jealous of something that you can actually achieve. So you're not going to be jealous of a president of, the com of a country. I'm never going to be president. I don't even want to be a president. You're not going to be jealous of a famous uh, football uh, player. Because I don't even know how to play football. I, it's not one of my dreams. I'll never be a famous football player. But you're jealous of somebody that is very close to you because you can see it and it's something that you can achieve. So according to the Eben Ezra, there's two things that most will cause a person to be jealous. A, of something that they can actually achieve or want to achieve, and somebody that is very close to you. You're not jealous of some random person that you saw their picture on Facebook and they live in Brazil. I don't need, I know this person. I'm jealous of somebody that I can see and I'm like, ooh, that. Ooh. Now, if this is the case, Let's say hypothetically we can go down in the di back in time in the time machine if you would be able to have an encounter with Korach. What would you tell him? What would you tell Korach? Relax, calm down. It's nonsense. What would you tell Korach? Because by the way, that was one of the most, again, another one of the severe sins that, uh, and the dramas that happened in the desert. Now, Going back to our topic, forget about the question now what you would tell Korach. We're going to answer that question as we go. But now that we're on the topic of the jealousy, is, you know, when you're looking at the concept of jealousy, the Torah doesn't address why one person is more successful than the other. If you ever stop and you look, how come that person is very successful in business and this person is not? How come that person is very good uh, relationship with his wife and this person is not? <clears throat> the Torah doesn't address such a thing. It doesn't even give us any type of information or knowledge why one person is more successful than the other. And it doesn't mean that one doesn't try or the other one doesn't have the ability. But the facts are that there are more successful people in everything and less successful people. And success is not only in money and in business, it can be in your learning, can be in uh, personal achievements, can be in relationships, can be in many different things, can even in Torah learning. Some people learn Torah for two or three years, they, 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 they dive into the Torah. Some people learn Torah their whole life, they don't even remember one verse. 
Now, more than that, if we're looking at this concept, trying to understand why one is more successful than the other, if you look a little bit deeper, is how come I many times on myself, I want to achieve something and I can't do it. Or I don't fulfill goals, dreams, and uh, different things that I wanted to achieve. How come? I mean, wh 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 why, was that? why would Hashem have an issue with me being successful? I want to be a, a Torah scholar. I'm not asking here to be a robber now. How come? I want to have a good relationship with my kids. How come I'm not successful? I'm successful with this kid, not with that kid. So a deeper question is, how come I don't always able to achieve what I want? Or my goals? Or to come to any type of uh, success? <coughs> so, before we continue... There's just going to be an, uh, another question that I'm going to ask, and don't worry, I'm going to answer all the questions at the end. <clears throat> Comes another big question when we're addressing the concept of jealousy, is, is jealousy good or bad? If I would run now a survey, what do you think? Very simple survey, one page, one answer. Is jealousy good or bad? What would you press, the yes or the no? <clears throat> Okay, if you're looking at uh, the teachings of our sages, then jealousy is a very bad thing. Look at Tractate Avot, chapter 4. It says clearly, Jealousy, lust, or desire, and uh, uh, trying to run after respect will cause the person to die. And that's in the ethics of our fathers. Obviously, our sages say, no, jealousy is a very bad uh, character trait. But why is it that bad that our sages say actually that it will cause a person to die? You know, most people, they pray to have a long life. Here our sages say, you want to shorten your life? No problem. Run after respect. Run after your lusts and your desires. And uh, have a lot of jealousy. <laughs> You'll shorten your life. But why Dafka, these three, or especially that we're talking about jealousy, why is that going to shorten your life? And the explanation our sages give is that there's no end to jealousy. It's not that you're jealous for a day. You're jealous here, then you'll be jealous there, and then you'll be jealous there. And it's, you don't get to a satisfaction. Oh, the person that I was jealous for got fired. That's it. I'm done with being jealous. Our sages say no. And, and gets lekina. It doesn't stop. It's like a hunger. You want more and more. If that's the weakness of the person, you'll always be jealous. Okay, so on one side, uh, some of the uh, participants in our survey said that jealousy is bad. But we also have on the other side of the poll, says that jealousy is good. Yeah, believe it or not. Where do you find that? In the Talmud, in Tracted Baba Batra, it says, Kinat sofrim tarbe chokhmah. When you are jealous of a scholar, then it will cause you to become more wiser. Okay? This is what the Talmud says, Baba Batra, page 21b. And it says there a story that if there's a, a little city, and in the city there's a Melamed, the rabbi that teaches the kids. Now he's growing older and older and older, but he's the only one who teaches the kids. It wasn't like then schools and... Now what happens if a young Melamed comes into the town, and he's fresh, good energy, you know, he wakes up early, not like the other one, the other one is already old, he's kind of run down. Then the Talmud addresses, what should, uh, what should it be? Now, uh, you know, the people start sending the kids to the younger one. What's going to happen with the older one? So some say, no, they should kick the younger one to a different city. He shouldn't come into and disturb in the little town with the older teacher. And the conclusion the sages come to is like, no, we need the younger one because that will cause some competition, like positive competition. Because if the older man is the only Melamed there, then he doesn't try too, too hard. But now he has competition. Suddenly the older Melamed needs to, you know, put some effort, come up with some new ideas, new topics, new ways to keep the kids focused. So this is a, a very healthy way of, uh, you know, inspiring somebody to get their act together and not to be like, eh. because our sages say, if a person doesn't have competition, then you stop investing 
you were just saying, I'm the only one here. What do I need to do? I don't need to do any promotions, any hard work. I don't need to, to, to push myself. I'm the number one. I'm the only one. So in Baba Batra it says, Kinat sofrim chokma. When I'm looking at another person and they have great achievements in the Torah, and I'm like, hey, I want to be like that. I want to know the Torah so well like this guy. How come he remembers all these verses of my heart? How come he sat in the class and he got it right away and I didn't get anything? Here he's saying that this is a good jealousy. Now interestingly, <clears throat> so before we continue, so we have on one side, Tractate Avot saying, no, Kina is one of the worst things that is out there. Kina means jealousy. On the other side, we have our sages in the Talmud says, no, Kina is a very good thing because it causes me to, it inspires me to put more effort. When I see you going faster, then I try to catch up. If not, I wouldn't do anything. Rashi says something very, very interesting that most people uh, don't even notice, the ones who read Rashi, <clears throat> most people re read Rashi very fast, they don't notice the wisdom be behind what he's saying. T Korach comes to Moshe Rabbeinu with a bunch of uh, ac accusations, right? A bunch of questions, a bunch of accusations. Many people don't notice what Moshe Rabbeinu answers to him. And Rashi uh, points that, and he says, Korach was a very tricky individual. Deceiver, tricky. And like I told you, he didn't come and advertise in his campaign, okay, guys, I think Moshe Rabbeinu uh, did his part. I think it's time to him to go home, and I'm presenting myself as the new potential prime minister. Korach didn't say that. Korach said to the people, you can be the leader. Why don't you be the leader? I think you will be a great leader. So he got everybody hyped up. How did he say that? All the congregation are all holy. Right? We're all Kedoshim. So anybody can uh, be a leader. So what did Moshe Rabbeinu answer to Korach? And this is where Rashi points it out. He says, oh... You jealous of Aaron for being the Kohen Gadol? I also want to be a Kohen Gadol. Gamani. So Moshe comes to Korah and tells him, You jealous? I'm jealous too. You want to be Kohen Gadol? I also wanted to be a Kohen Gadol. Look in the Torah. I wanted to be the Kohen Gadol. And Hashem says, No, 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 no. Your brother becomes the Kohen Gadol. So Moshe Rabbeinu answers to Korah in the same level. He says, I'm, I also want. I'm, I'm on your side, by the way. I would also want to be the high priest. And that, by the way, is the source to the, the teachings from the Talmud. That when I look at somebody else who's very successful, and I want to... Sofer in the Talmud is not the scribe, by the way. He's a teacher. Because the story in the Talmud is talking about when there's a teacher in a town that teaches all the kids, and then a young teacher comes. But the fact is that when there's somebody else who's doing an amazing job and I'm looking up to that person and I, I want to be like that. I'm going to work out real hard now so I can reach to those uh, 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 grades or so that success to those results. That's Kinat Sofrim, Tarbe Chochma. So what do we see here? Something very uh, contradicting in our sages. One group of sages say no, jealousy is very, very bad. Another group of sages, what are you talking about? Jealousy is the best thing possible. It creates competition, creates excitement. So, one side, the one who's saying that jealousy is bad, they say to the extent, it will kill you. Eventually you'll come, you'll, you'll, and the result will be death. But the other side that says, no, jealousy is good, no, that creates competition, a healthy competition. And you see how they do that sometimes in schools, that they're saying, okay, whoever gets the best grade is the winner. They do all sorts of competitions, and everybody's trying to work harder. So on the other hand, jealousy is not only that it's good, it creates a very good t type of competition. So now we're left with another two questions. A is, as I mentioned before, is jealousy good or bad? We didn't come to the conclusion yet. I, I don't know which one you pr pressed in the survey I sent, but we're still left with his jealousy good and bad. You'll submit your uh, selection at the end of the class. And the other question that I told you before, what should a person tell himself when he finds himself, he, she, in a place of jealousy? 
Two questions. <clears throat> now, I will take a little uh, uh, detour and talk about something else. But that will help us understand what we need to take from here. Now, in case, I'm sure you all noticed, whether it's in a positive way or a negative way, but the symbol or the logo, or I don't know how you even call it, in Hebrew it's called semel habriut, the symbol of health is a snake on a stick. Okay? The last two or three years when everybody's involved with the World Health Organization and all the rest of the junk, so you probably noticed once or twice when you went to the pharmacy, to the doctors, anything that has to do with the symbol of health is a snake on a stick. Why? <laughs> What's the connection between a snake and a stick and health? I mean, we associate the snake as one of the most lowly creatures in nature. So snake symbolizes health. Okay, so by the way, it's the Greeks that invented the whole snake on the, on the, stick, on the stick. But you know where they took it from? <laughs> they took it from the Torah in Parashat Chukat. So basically, the Torah is coming and saying, Oh yeah, you want health? Then put a snake on a stick. Okay, so later on, the Greeks take, took it and made a symbol out of it. What's very, very interestingly, because we see that now the deception, I'm just saying it as a, as a side note and as, as something that I noticed, we see now that the deception before Mashiach is coming is coming through the Department of Health. Many, many people thought the final war will be nuclear bombs and uh, physical war. But now we see that uh, what is coming closer to the end, it's all through the health department. And we see that the ones who are kind of running the show is all through the, the department of health. And interestingly, you know, the one who's running the show is the Nachash. Kind of like saying, I'm here, I'm going to run the show, I'm going to be the one who's controlling everything. Even though the Nachash, the serpent, the Samech Mem, is not in the shape of a serpent. But nevertheless, just saying that as an observation. But let's go back to our topic. How come the snake became the symbol of health? Almost everywhere you go, you'll see the snake. <clears throat> so, if you're going to Parashat Chukat, in the book of Amidbar, chapter 21, I mean, we're going to read it in two weeks. They, towards the end of the time in the desert, again, they're complaining and there's a plague and the snakes come out and they start biting everybody. Moshe Rabbeinu asks Hashem what to do. And Hashem tells uh, the, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, and let whoever is bitten look at, uh, look at it and live. Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu to take a snake, a copper snake, put it on a copper stick and to tell everybody, well, you got bitten, look at the snake. So what do you want from the Greeks right now? Hashem told Moshe to do it. Comes a big question. Many, many uh, commentaries ask, why the snake? What, 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 what do we take from that? Interestingly, the Balatanya asks the same thing, by saying, but why, why the snake? Why couldn't Hashem put something else? Maybe the picture of Moshe Rabbeinu? Or maybe, uh, you know, an image of the tablets? Something! Something holy! Why are you uh, telling everybody to, to... You put a snake and you tell everybody to look at the snake. What's the message here? So the message is very, very interesting. That Hashem says when you have troubles, look at them from above. The same way that they were all dying from the snakes and look up to the snake. The Hashem says when you are going through some type of trouble, look above. Now what does it mean look above? Look at what? What am I going to look at? At the chemtrails? What do you want me to look at? Hashem says, when you have a problem in your life, when you have an issue or difficulties, Hashem says, try to look at the problem not from your angle. Try to look at what I'm hinting to you through the problem. So when Hashem says, look at the problem from above, don't look at that right now I'm in stress and I have difficulties and problems. And Hashem says, no, 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 no. Look above. Try now to relate with what I'm trying to tell you. 
I sent you difficulties with Parnasa, with your livelihood. Look at what, what, what's the hint here. I'm hinting to you something. You have issues with the education of your kids. I'm hinting to you something. Can get along with your spouse. There's a hint there. Saying in other words, Hashem is saying, what, what do I mean with this snake? I'm telling you now to look at the snake. That's in the Torah. But now Hashem tells you, I'm telling you to look at something. What do I mean? Most people, when they have an issue or challenge or problems, they're looking at the problem. It's not fair. I can't deal with this. Why is that person suing me? Why is my kid not listening to me? Why is my spouse giving me such hardship? That's what we look at when I'm dealing with a certain individual or a certain issue. Shem says, no, no, no. Take a stop and look at it from above. What am I trying to hint to you? <clears throat> Saying, in other words, don't look at the issue or the challenge from your eyes. That's very, very limiting because I don't see why the ch challenge came. Now, if the person takes that approach and does cheshbon nefesh, usually when there's an issue in my life, then I don't do cheshbon nefesh. Cheshbon nefesh means like interception, right? That's what he said, interception, inter yeah? In in yeah, introspection, thank you. Most people, when they suffer something, they blame the whole world. Instead of saying, wait, 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 maybe I did something. Maybe I caused this issue by my behavior. What is Hashem trying to tell me? The car got hit. Some damage over here. This person is slandering me. Trashing my name. Now I would of course go and blame the whole world. Hashem says no, 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 no. Take a moment and do chesh nefesh. I'm sending you a hint. The smart person says wait a minute. Maybe I did something. Maybe in the morning I spoke rude to my wife. Maybe the person that asked me for help, I shoot them off right away. Maybe I was supposed to do this and I end up doing that. Shem says, I want you to do cheshbon nefesh. I want you to look inside and try to figure out what is the hint? What am I trying to tell you? You are not Avraham Avinu. I'm not going to reveal myself to you. It has to come through some type of a hint. So don't be arrogant and don't be limited by looking at the snake and saying, Why? Look at it from above and say, oh, I wonder what Hashem is trying to hint to me. When a person is jealous, and now we're going to kind of go back to the same place that we started, that we all have jealousy at some point. Whether it's for a period of a, a year or two, or maybe for a second. But if I experience some type of jealousy, I'm looking now, I'm walking in, my, in the street, just going to give you one example out of many. Just had an argument with my wife, I'm very upset, bad relationship, marriage is not working out. I don't know if to leave, if to say, I'm not telling it all by myself, by the way, I'm just giving you an example. I'm bitter, I'm going upset, she always says this, she says that, I can't stand this woman. And, and then I, in my mind, I'm... Um, Building up and building up. And then I look to the other side of the street and I see a couple, not in their 20s, in love. In their 60s, holding hands. Honey, how are you feeling? Can I get you here? Please sit. And I'm like, why can't I have a normal relationship? Why can't my wife be nice like her? That's it. That's a moment of jealousy. That I'm jealous at why their relationship is working out. Mine not. Now, why am I giving you this example? Because when I tell you we all have jealousy, you're thinking, I'm not jealous of anybody. I just gave you one example out of many. How come that person right now, it's working what I want to work for me? And I can give you now another 500 examples. You got the point. It doesn't have to be something long that the person is building a palace in front of your home and every time the hammer... Oh, oh. How come he has 16 bedrooms and I have one bedroom? How come my roof is falling apart and that guy is driving a Mercedes? That's a different type of example. But the examples, can, you have to use your own imagination. But if I experience that moment of jealousy, I have to look up to the snake. Of course, not, don't look for snakes. And definitely don't look at the serpent. But I have to look up. And then I have to ask myself a question. Is this a good jealousy or bad jealousy? Now, it depends what the answer you're going to get. So let's say it again. You are going through some type of an experience. And it can be something so refined 
And, and, and Bemet, it can be in each and every one of us that you, at this moment, want something, it didn't happen, and right away in front of you it happened. Three seconds, a minute of a little bit of jealousy. Ugh, I wish my kid would give me such kavod. That's it. Five seconds that you look at another person. Then you have to stop yourself, look up, and say, okay, stop. Is this a good jealousy right now or a bad jealousy? So I'll tell you a story, a quick story. I said that story many, many times. And I'll answer the question, by the way. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you in a cliffhanger. I'll tell you a story, and I told that story many, many times. In uh, the dynasty of Chabad, of Lubavitch, one of the rabbis, uh, known as the Rebbe Rashab, he uh, uh, was, not the older he was not the older brother, was the younger brother. Okay? And the younger brother was more physically developed than the older brother. So the older brother was short, and he looked younger. So everybody thought that he's the younger brother and gave all the respect and the, and the first come to the younger brother. And he got very upset from that. How come he's getting all the attention? I'm the older brother. He happens to be. He's taller than me. Now, for kids, that's the big issue, that the younger one looks older. So one time, what did he do? He digs a little hole in the ground and he tells his uh, younger brother, who's taller than him, why don't you go into the pit, into the little hole, that way I'm going to be taller than you. So the mother was a very a smart mother who overheard the kids uh, in the backyard. So she came to the older brother and she told him, instead of putting your younger brother in a pit or in a hole so you can be taller, try to climb on a stone and then you'll be higher. Don't bury your brother so you can be taller. In other words, okay? And maybe I butchered here and there some of the words, but the, the, the message is the same. Don't bury somebody else because you want to be taller. You want to be taller? Then bring a stool or bring a stone, rise yourself up, and you will be higher than him. That's it. So there are two types of jealousy in the world. When we're going back to the question that I told you, is that a good je jealousy or bad jealousy? Because I told you, we have now a, a little bit of a conflict. Because on one side, we have sages that are saying, jealousy is the worst thing. And on the other side, we have sages that are saying, what are you talking about? Jealousy is the best thing that can happen to you. So we have a conflict right now, a contradiction. So when I need to figure out if something is a good jealousy or bad jealousy, then let's analyze it. There are two types of jealousies in the world. One type of jealousy is that I'm occupied with making you lower, burying you, putting you down. That's the uh, one, first type of jealousy. That's the jealousy that our sages says, that will end up killing you. That's kind, that's Korach, and many others. But there's another type of jealousy in this world. The type of jealousy that I look at you and I'm jealous of you, and I'm trying to say, how can I learn from you? You are successful. How can I be also successful? What can I learn from this wise man? From this wise individual? How smart he is. Look how he did it. Unbelievable. That type of jealousy is a good jealousy. That I look at you and I'm like, wow, I want to be that. How can I learn from this person? Instead of going and slandering this individual, coming and saying, you know what? You are amazing. Can you teach me how you achieve that? Are you willing to share with me your secret? That's, that's unbelievable. Where do we find in the Torah that type of jealousy? Because I told you in the beginning, we, when we rewind the story, we went all the way back to the first week of creation, the first jealousy with an Ahash, with a serpent, then with Cain. And now we're talking about Korach. But uh, run a quick search in your, uh, in your uh, servers about the Torah, well, where do we learn about a very positive jealousy in the Torah that is exactly what I told you now, a good positive jealousy? I'll give you two and a half seconds. In the book of Bereshit, chapter 30, verse 1, it says that Rachel was jealous of her sister, Leah. Very simple, and Rachel envied her sister. What? No, but that was a very, very positive jealousy. First of all, you have to understand that Rachel was supposed to marry Yaakov. Leah marries her. She's quiet. 
Later on, she marries Yaakov, but what happens? Leah has all the kids. Everybody has kids. Just Rachel is like... And then it says in the Torah that Rachel envied Leah. Now, on the surface, one might say, what? Rachel is envying Leah? Rashi says, Bemaseya HaTovim. Rashi says she was jealous in, her, in Leah's good deeds. Oh, Rachel looked at Leah and says, wow. She got married first to the husband that I wanted to marry. She has all the first four kids. Must be that she's doing such unbelievable mitzvot. I'm jealous of her, of her good deeds. In a way that says, oh, how can I become as great as her? And if I become as great as her, then I'll be blessed with kids too. She didn't try to slander Leah. She didn't try to make her lower or to bury her or to ban her. She didn't come to Yitzhak, to Yaakov. Oh, by the way, you know what Leah said? <laughs> she looked at Leah and says, wow, she's successful. Must be that she did something right. Now, what is that thing that she's doing? And Rashi says it clear. She was jealous in her good deeds. So what's the message? When there is something bad in my life, and each and every one of us can raise their hand right now, there's something bad in my life, right? Chas shalom, financial loss, bad divorce, bad relationship, sicknesses, and many other bad things. We all deal with many, many, many things. But if there's something bad going on in my life, you know what it means? Then it's from Hashem. If you can now contradict what I said, I will ask you to leave the room. I don't want to be in the presence of a heretic. Something bad's going on in your life? That's only from Hashem. Don't blame your neighbor, your spouse, your, your, your employer. It's Hashem. Why is Hashem doing something bad in my life? Is that I should try to figure out what I'm doing wrong. End of story. Now take that and make a bumper sticker out of it. If something's bad in my life, is Hashem trying to tell me, you're doing something wrong. Now figure it out by yourself. You know what the famous Levi Yitzchak from Bardichov says? He says, Ma shetov mimcha. What's good comes from you. Ma shera mimcha. What's bad from you. Vimara mimcha. How's it tov? And if the bad is from you, then it's good. Unbelievable wisdom. Hashem will do something bad to you? If Hashem did it, if the bad comes from Hashem, which we figured that out, then it has to be good if it's coming from Hashem. So next time that you are experiencing some difficulties in your life, then don't look around who to blame. You look up, Hashem, please help me see what I'm doing wrong. I understand that you're sending me now a message. Help me understand what I'm doing wrong. Remember last class that I told you when you have a problem, you ask for advice, how did we conclude the class? Ask yourself. What are you going to be asking advice now from the entire world? Shem is trying to tell you, I'm trying to wake you up. Why? So I can fix whatever wrongdoing that I'm doing. If I have a bad relationship with my, with my spouse, maybe I'm mistreating my spouse. Or maybe I'm mistreating somebody else. So it comes around as some miscommunication between me and my wife. And if I'm suffering some financial loss, maybe I'm stealing somebody's money without even noticing, by the way. The other day, somebody stopped me on the street, said something, and then he said something, Gezel. I told him, this is not Gezel. But if you're already interested in the topic, then go and learn what Gezel is. Most people are failing with Gezel, by the way. Gezel, the translation is robbery, but it's not robbery at a gunpoint. Is that I make somebody else experience a loss and it's not only financial because of my act so if i'm now dealing with some financial issues maybe i'm doing gesel somewhere else and i don't even notice and sometimes it can be in something minor and i don't even know it's gesel and now it's definitely not time to elaborate on gesel but i spoke about it many 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 times and most people fail in gesel because they don't know what it is and they think, I don't need to ask permission. Well, you probably do. And if Hashem is now showing me some type of a, 
a, a challenge, I need to know, okay, wh what is Hashem trying to tell me? Because we're looking all the time, and we can be very observant, but when it comes to my own issues, right away, I have to blame the entire world. Why is my son not listening to me? Well, maybe you're not listening to the Father in heaven. So your son is not listening to you. And again, I'm just now giving you many, many examples. You use your common sense to understand that when something is going wrong in your life, when there's a trouble, there's bad, Hashem is trying to tell you, you are doing something wrong. Look inside yourself, do chesed nefesh, and you'll figure it out. You know why? Because the master of the universe didn't create anything bad. You can't say, oh, Hashem made a boo-boo. Huh, that's a mistake. Hashem didn't do any mistakes. And I can tell you already that he didn't create anything bad. Which now will raise a lot of questions. But what about Bill Gates? Uh, what, uh, maybe he's not that bad. Maybe he's here just to wake us up. To become better individuals. I, I, don't put my, I don't have any claims to this individual. Or to many other of the psychotic individuals in our generation. I have no problem with them. That's Hashem's issue. I need to look at these individuals. And what, what is Hashem trying to tell me? Must be that if right now the control over this world is done by evil people, must be that we're doing something. Our issue is not with them. Our issue is with the master of the universe. So Hashem didn't create anything bad. I perceive it as bad because I am limited. I have to take the message and understand what is Hashem trying to tell me. Now, let's uh, for one second... Take the concept of jealousy and we'll call it an emotion. Okay? Let's not call it a sin at this point. And I'm not going to call it now an attribute. Let's call it an emotion. Right? I see something. I feel this jealousy. Right? There's an emotion in me. A negative emotion. Now, we are learning in many different uh, books about the Tikkun Amidot, right? The refinement of my character. After this class, we're learning Tomer Dvorah, one of the most uh, dominating books of Tikkun Amidot. We learn Shari Kedusha and many others. So we learn about Midot Ra'ot, right? About bad Midot. We learn it in many different times. Jealousy and hate and anger and sadness. And but let's for a second define jealousy as an emotion. Now, if you're looking at the, the characteristic or the character, the attribute of jealousy, then uh, one might say, okay, this is a, a bad thing. But I told you not once and not twice that the word in Hebrew for attributes or characteristics is a midah, a measurement. And I told you that many, many times that the problem when it comes to the midot is how much of the midah is being applied. Because there are many midot that are good midot. Chesed is great. But too much chesed is not good. You want to water your flowers. Too much water will kill everything. Avram had too much chesed. So even on the good things, the reason why it's called in Hebrew midah, because you have to measure how much. When you're cooking something, you're, making, you're baking a cake, you put too much sugar, it will be disgusting. Too less, it will be... Ugh. It has to be perfect. Not that I'm telling you to put sugar in your cake. I'm just saying in general. So you get the idea. But, you know, forget about the sugar. You're cooking. Put a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. You, it, the, the, bad, the, the old matter is how much. Sometimes you put too much pepper. Ugh, you can't even eat it. Same thing here when it comes to the minot. Anger, there's no question that anger is very, very bad. We spoke about it in many different places. But anger in a very small portion might be good. Or when it's directed to the right place. So when I'm talking about jealousy as an emotion, then it's how much do I overreact with this emotion? Now, if I overreact with the emotion, the emotion then it's bad. Going back to my... Uh, <laughs> To my uh, survey, if jealousy is good or bad. If I overreact with it, it's bad. Now I have to understand that if I don't overreact with it and I apply it in the right measure, then the jealousy is good because it stimulates me. It will also uh, 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 like an incentive. When I want to get somebody to do something better, I have to give an incentive. 
If I'm not going to give any incentive, or there's not going to be any stimulation, then the person will be, okay, I'll just... Uh, if I have salespeople working for me, I need incentive. Whoever will sell the most this week gets a, a weekend in the, I don't know where, in Elat, in the Bahamas. I give an incentive. Now they're jealous. He booked three, I booked four. But that's a good jealousy because I'm doing a lot of stimulation. So when it comes to jealousy, if I overreact with it as, a, as an emotion, then it's bad. Then it will cause a lot of problems. But if I use it in the right measure, then it causes a very good thing because it causes you to work harder, to put some effort. Especially when I'm looking inwards. If I feel this motion of jealousy and I'm looking outwards, that's already your sign that it's going to be bad. If it's turned inwards, then you're already saying, wait, this is going to end up being good. Because I looked at something, it caused me to be jealous. If I keep it there, then it will develop to be something negative. If I turn it inside, okay, how, am I getting, how can I get better? How can next week I can come with those results? Oh, oh let me think how I can uh, become better here. <coughs> Excuse me. But the foundation, in essence, jealousy is a very positive thing. Because if a person is greater than you in the spiritual world, then you, then you want to be jealous of them. I want to be jealous of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. I want to be jealous of the Ariya Kadosh and Moshe Rabbeinu. Look at the achievements that they, they, they uh, did. But... The jealousy has to be, the approach is that I have to learn from that person. Now I'm saying now Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm looking now at another person and I'm jealous of their spiritual achievements. Then the jealousy has to be like, how can I learn from that? And not to wish for that person to be destroyed, to fail, to chas v'shalom, something bad will happen to him. Because the negative jealousy is when I wish to that person not to be that successful. But if I'm looking at somebody else's success and I'm taking from that the inspiration to become better and trying to learn how to become better because of his success, then the jealousy is a very good thing. If I start wishing for that person to fail or not to succeed, then obviously you already have your answer very well. Jealousy is bad. When is jealousy going to be good? When it's inspiring me to become a much better person. If I'm looking now at a father and a child walking in the street and the child is giving a lot of honor to the father and I'm like, why, why my kid doesn't do that? So instead of being jealous of this individual, it's like, okay, ah, maybe this father gives a lot of time to his child and the child in return has a lot of respect to him. Ah, so maybe I should actually ask my child next time, how was his day? Instead of telling him I'm busy right now. Or, why are you dressed like that? Why didn't you go to school? Why didn't you get good grades? So, and again, I'm just trying to give you a little bit of examples is how you take that emotion and decide how much you're going to use it. Are you going to use the emotion of jealousy to put that person down and occupy yourself with only of that? Or are you taking this emotion and saying, hmm, how can I get better? What is Hashem trying to show me? Where am I failing? Boom, that's it. That's a good jealousy. Now let's go to the next question. I told you the first question is jealousy is good or bad. Now what do you tell a person that is jealous? In the moment of the jealousy, what do you tell yourself? So I'll tell you a, a <clears throat> quick story. There's a famous Hasid. He's known as Mendel Futterfass. And this individual was uh, in the Soviet Union at the time when Stalin was going after uh, every normal individual, and not only Jews, by the way, he, uh, you know, when, when communism was uh, in control and they wanted the, 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 that it would be perceived that communism is a good thing, so one of the ways of doing it is removing all the smart people that can come and say, hey, it doesn't work. It's all a hoax. So that's what Stalin did. They started removing all these individuals that can cause a problem and took them to work camps and so forth. So this Mendel Futterfass worked in a, in a work camp for eight years. Now this wasn't like some jolly place where they're, they're enjoying themselves. It's hard labor, borderline of slavery. Okay, so there's a story 
that uh, they would work uh, all the day and by five o'clock in the afternoon finish the day of work and go to their uh, cells, to their cabins, whatever, and be locked in there. But who, who wants to go to sleep at five o'clock in the afternoon? So they would play and talk and whatever. So there was once uh, an, an incident that uh, they, uh, somebody took a pack of cards and they started playing cards, which was of course prohibited in the camp. So the guard comes in and of course they hid the cards right away and the guard says, is anybody playing cards here? I heard cards. No, no, no cards, no, no cards here. So the guard starts searching the entire cabin, can't find the cards. Goes out, they pull out the cards and they continue playing. And again, the guard comes in, they hide the cards, is anybody playing cards here? No, no cards here, we don't play cards. And he starts turning the whole place upside down. Can't find the cards. Third time, the same thing. This time he gets everybody undressed. He's looking for the cards. Like, I heard the cards. No, no cards. He gets everybody undressed. They can't find the cards. Guard goes crazy, goes out. So uh, Mendel Futafas notice what's going on here. So he went to the guy who was running the, the game and he says, where is the cards? How, how, are you do, how are you doing that? So the guy told him, you see this guy over there? His uh, profession is, uh, how do you call it, a pickpocket? Mm -hmm. The guy who bumps into you and he takes your stuff? He's like, he's like the number one pickpocket in Moscow. That's why he's here. So every time that the guard would walk in, he would put the cards in the guard's pocket. And the guard didn't even think of looking at his own pockets and he would look around, couldn't find the card. And then the guard would leave, whoop, and takes the card away. And every time he would put the cards in the guard's pocket. <clears throat> so Mendel Futofas was the type of individual, if you ever heard him speak, uh, then he would take a life um, a story or some message out of every little thing that happens. I shared some of his stories in, in some other classes. He would always look at something and get a very good message from it. So he says, wow, in life, it's the same thing. When we're looking a lot at others, we don't look inside by ourselves. Same, guy, same thing that the guard was looking at everybody. He didn't think of looking in his own pocket. Who thinks to look in his own pocket? So he says the same thing. When we're busy constantly looking at others, we don't look inside ourselves. So the answer to the question, and that was like a three, uh, uh, three questions really, because I told you, first question is what would you say to Korach if you would see him? Second question that I told you is what would you tell a person that is jealous or yourself in that moment? And I also asked you another question. How do you cause a person to understand that what's going on in their life is the best thing that can happen to them? Because I told you, how come one person is successful and the other one is not? So take all these questions, and they all have one simple answer. There's no such thing as two identical people. Not in this room, not in this city, not in this country, not in the world. You're not going to find two people that are perfectly identified, even if they're twins or siblings. The master of the universe created billions and billions of people, and not one of them is identical to the other. They're all different. Can you imagine? You know, well, what do we have now in our generation? Seven, eight billion people? In a hundred years, there was also seven, eight billion. And a hundred years before that, another seven, eight billion. You're talking about billions of people. Not one person in the world has the same fingerprint like you. Nobody's identical to each other. Everybody's different. Completely, completely different. First of all, that's in itself an unbelievable miracle how the master of the universe can make so many different entities. And that's the same thing in nature. You might look at a certain fish, they all have the same pattern, but if you look real close, they're not the same. Now why is that so profound? When uh, Baruch Hashem, there's good news and a baby is born, what is one of the first questions that people ask? Okay. Boy or girl? Okay, let's not get into that. But what is one of the first questions that people ask? Who does it look like? We have a boy. Who does it look like? Does it matter? Who does it look like? You know and how many times I heard that? I'm Baruch Hashem. Hashem blessed me with seven kids. Who does it look like? What does it matter? 
It's a cute kid. Does it look like your mother? Does it look like the father? Does it look like the father's side? Does it matter who does the kid looks like? Let him look like himself. The thing is that the baby doesn't need to look like somebody. You don't need to look like somebody. You need to be yourself. And when you try to make the baby look like somebody, why are you trying to make him look like this individual? Hashem says to us, in other words, I don't have an automatic production, like a factory that is the same thing. With me, it's not the same thing. Nothing resembles each other. Not even a leaf of a tree will resemble another leaf. All the leaves are different. No clones in the domain of the master of the universe. Everything is different. Everything is completely different than its other. And that's one of the uniqueness of the master of the universe. Nothing in this world is 100% identical. Not humans, not animals, not vegetations, nothing. Saying in other words that if we want to put it in some type of a metaphor, the world is like a puzzle. Okay, you're looking at a picture with many, many, many pixels or pieces and every piece is different. Look now, you do a puzzle. 500 piece puzzle, 2000 piece puzzle. Is one of the pieces the same? They're all different. And if chas v'shalom, one of the pieces is missing, then the picture is not perfect. Saying in other words, that each individual in this world has his own tafkid, his own part in the world, his mission, his task, his purpose. You know, if you stop for a second and think about that, Every person in the world has their own purpose. Billions of people in the world. And every person has a purpose. Because Hashem doesn't create something with no purpose. Now if this is the case, it means that you are unique. And you have a very specific task in this world that is your purpose. Not equal to any other person in the world. Did you think about that at any time of your life? That I am very unique. When Hashem created me, look at how many details He thought. Every little detail of, of my existence, my personality, my hobbies, what I like, what I don't like. And now forget about right now, if, right now if you're successful or not. It's irrelevant. You are unique in the eyes of Hashem. Your purpose in this world is one of a kind. There's no other you in this world that can replace you right now. Try to internalize what Hashem is telling you. If I would create people that are the same, then I think that everybody can be cloned, chas v'shalom ra'aleinu, but that these people are the same. So when you are born, Hashem is telling you, in other words, there's nobody like you. Now you don't need Hashem to send you an email with that, but any person... In this world, the Shem is telling, in other words, there's nobody like you. It doesn't matter right now, good or bad. You need to look at the mirror and say, I'm a one of a kind. You know, it means a one of a kind. You know how expensive I am if I'm a one of a kind. If it's the same type of the production, you know, if you look like it's special jewelry, special uh, watches or fancy cars, they make a hundred. Special edition. You are a special edition. There's only one like you. Now, when Hashem is telling you that you are a special addition, you know what else He tells you? I gave you a role in this world. You think I created you to just sit and bum around all day long? I don't need it. I have enough bums. I created you with a role, with a mission, with a task in this world. So when I'm jealous of another person, you know what I say? I don't want to do what Hashem told me to do. I'm not accepting the role that Hashem gave me. That's a little bit of a chutzpah to tell the master of the universe. Sorry to tell you, I'm not happy with what you told me to do. I want to be that. You basically are rebelling against your own mission. You're going against your own destiny. You're basically saying, whatever was designated to me, I don't like that. I want that. Now comes a big question. Why are you so different than other people? Because Hashem says, I want you exactly how you are. That's it. 
Didn't, I don't want you rich, I want you poor. I don't want you successful, I want you not successful. Why? That's what I want. You know, there's a famous story that there was a, a certain town that uh, was Erev Shabbat, the eve of Shabbat, <clears throat> and two individuals arrived in town. One of them was a very rich individual, and the other one, like the Gvil, the, the, the wealthy individual, and another one that arrived at the same time was uh, the type of individual, like a mechanic, but at the times they didn't have cars, they had like wagons and horses. That was like the type of person that deals with wagons and horses, okay? It's called the Glon. Like today, you have an issue with your car, you take it to the garage. Then you had an issue with the donkey or the carriage or the wagon, you take it to the Eglon. Okay, both arrive maybe half an hour before Shabbat to the town and both go to the mikveh and take a shower. Now the Eglon, eh, chick chak is a simple person, goes in and out, washes himself and goes out. The rich person, he goes in with conditioner and shampoo and body lotion and this and scrap my back and scrap my toe. And of course, when he goes out of the shower, dresses beautiful clothes for Shabbat, fancy, custom tailored. And the other guy, simple guy. Now, as the rich person goes out of the shower and he's all dressed nice, Right before Shabbat, he sees another Jew driving into the town with his horse and buggy, and he got stuck in the mud. And the person is trying to get the buggy out of the mud, and the horse is stuck in there. And So the rich person says, it's another Jew, it's a few minutes before Shabbat, but I'm not going to help him. He goes into the mud, gets dirty, tries to push the horse out, tries to push the wagon out, he gets dirty, full of mud, sweaty. And then Shabbat comes, and he wasn't successful, and everything stayed in the mud, and he's all dirty. He can't go to the shul right now, all dirty. He goes home, he gets upset, takes the dirty clothes off, he washes himself, he doesn't want to go to shul anymore, so he stays at home. And the horse and buggy of the other guy stuck in the mud. Now in the meantime, on the other side of town, the Eglon, the one who takes care of the horse and buggies, he goes to shul. Now, all the poor people are waiting at the end of the services to go home and to have a Shabbat meal by somebody, which usually would be the rich person who takes everybody home to eat with him. But he stayed at home because he was all dirty from the mud. So they're all standing there with nobody to go to eat. And who's standing there? The Eglon. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't have any food. He can't take any guests home. So he goes home and all the poor people are staying hungry in the synagogue. And what is the story telling you? The rich person, his job is to feed the hungry people after the service. The Eglon is the one who has to go and get dirty into the, and, and take the horse and buggy out. They switch roles. He wasn't successful, he wasn't successful. The rich person was able, wasn't able to do it and the horse and buggy stayed in the mud and the other person didn't have the money to feed anybody. They switch roles. That means one is better than the other? No, his role is to be the rich person. His role is to be the one who gets dirty, gets the horse and buggy out. So when a chas v'shalom, when a person feels sadness or emptiness or jealousy, because I'm looking at another person and I think I want to be in that position, you have to think how much effort and thought went into the creation of you. When you're looking at another person and saying, oh, I wish I would be in that position, stop. And say, wait a minute, no, Hashem, if Hashem wanted me to be there, then I would be there. But I'm here. And you know how much effort Hashem made it that I'll be here? That is not my job, not my role. This is my role. Saying in other words, if you would uh, take this scenario and go back to Korach, what would you tell him? You know what you would tell uh, uh, Korach? If you are the Eglon, do your job. So really when we're looking at it, to conclude, you know, at the time of the confrontation, they're all were saying, we want to be a Kohen Gadol. What does Moshe Rabbeinu says? Let's go to sleep, Right? And in the morning, let's deal with it. Why in the morning? <laughs> deal with it right now. Okay, so some say to calm down, sleep, sleep on it, relax. 
Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to tell them the same way that we need the morning, we also need the night. You don't have a full day with one of them. We have a full day when we have the night and when we have the morning. We are not complete if we're all the same. You are the Kohen Gadol, you are not. You are the leader, you are not. You are the teacher, he's the Kohen Gadol. In order to make a full day, you need the morning and the night. Saying, in other words, if the, the, the jealousy is positive, then it's good, because it's going to promote you. It's going to make you a better person. If it's not making you a better person, then I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not accepting the role that Hashem told me. And needless to say, then the jealousy turns out to be very, very, very negative, which the result will be Motsim et Adam in Olam. Eventually, it will make you lose your, this world in Chaz Veshalom Yibiz Olam Abba. And when I can take these emotions and understand that the world is not complete without me or you, and your job is just as important as mine, and how can I take your success and apply that I can learn from you and be successful, then the jealousy is a very positive thing. But when I turn the whole thing around, then I end up being rebelling against my role, going against Hashem, and needless to say, not achieving anything positive in this world, and therefore you can now choose on the poll that I told you whether jealousy is good or bad, is that jealousy is very bad. Now you choose if you want to be you, or you think that you need to be somebody else.